Well, a name really, Hannah, but it's probably not what you think, so uh, listen up. We, a few years ago, we had uh, that word E or uh, extreme sports being thrown around. People would jump off buildings and cliffs and all sorts of things and uh, you know, threaten their lives with uh, doing these crazy things. Now we've got uh, extreme worship here in our church <laughs> and I'm trying to come to terms with it. Uh, Zoom is one thing, I'm just about getting there. Ron, you're watching, Ken, we're doing well on that but I wasn't ready with a PowerPoint for this morning uh, so you'll just have to listen carefully as we look at these uh, several verses under the theme of Hannah and I'll explain what that means shortly. First of all, COVID. I understood a week ago what that actually stands for. I didn't know up until then. It's citizens of Victoria ignoring distancing. <laughs> uh, and last, last Sunday we were praying. We were praying not just for Victoria, but the whole nation under the COVID pandemic. And uh, we were asked to pray that the Lord would... Uh, Put an end, bring an end to the pandemic. I reckon that's probably a fairly valid prayer to pray. Uh, but we must realise that God has got a much bigger purpose. He's, it's not taking him by surprise. He has allowed it to happen. He has allowed it to be here in our midst. And we've got to deal with it spiritually. And uh, I reckon what COVID is, as well as all these other catastrophes, even the great explosion, that horrible explosion in Beirut, uh, is a wake-up call, is it not? All of these things that are happening in our lives, whether they be sore feet, or backs, or shingles, or uh, I woke up this morning at four o'clock with a ringing in my ears, it's always there, never without it, but I was reminded of my tinnitus, not tinea, tinnitus, uh, this morning, and uh, it's a, a sort of trial that I would like the Lord to, to lift, but maybe I'll have to wait till eternity, till the Lord comes. I'm reminded of this song, This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. My, the angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. I'm not Jim Reeves, or I would have sung it for you. It's a beautiful hymn reminding us where our priorities should be focused. I meet every Wednesday uh, with some of the other ministers, uh, church leaders of the area, and Gary Underwood from the Australian Christian Church was there. He's a principal of the college, principal co Australian Christian College, not church, Australian Christian College. Uh, Gary was there and he was talking about running a course that ACC have formulated to help overcome biblical illiteracy. He employs Christian teachers, but today so many who call themselves Christians can't really give a proper account of the hope that they have in Christ Jesus. So this is a course that he's running to help them uh, overcome or be more proficient in their biblical understanding so that they can answer the questions that children in their classes are going to raise with them from time to time. Now, uh, with me at the meeting was John Nicholl, who's leaving in a couple of weeks' time from the local Presbyterian church. He's retiring after about 11 years of service here in the Caboolture area, and he'll be sorely missed. But he was talking about going up to his physiotherapist, I think up Biwa, or up that way somewhere. And in talking, uh, John revealed that he was a Christian, and the physio said, oh, I am too. And John said, oh, where do you go to church? He said, I go to a Pentecostal church at Caloundra, or something like that. Uh, and he said to John, what are you preaching on this Sunday? And he said, I'm uh, preaching from the book of Hebrews, doing a series. And uh, the physiotherapist says, oh, is that a book of the Old Testament, is it? Do you see what we're talking about? 
biblical illiteracy, uh, people not even knowing where the books of the Bible are found, let alone what's in them. Uh, and we've got to do something about that, particularly in light of the world we're living in today. Going further and further to the left, in other words, as uh, Martin Isles calls it, to cultural Marxism. And, uh, of course, it's being underpinned by Darwinian evolutionary theory, which is being taught to our children at a very early age, and then certainly uh, you don't get your university degree unless you can uh, sort of handle uh, the Darwinian uh, lectures that are being thrown at you in the lecture halls. So we've got to know our faith a lot better than we've ever known it before to cope with this world we're living in. We've got to be better than we ever have been before as a, a, a church in a country where Christianity has been accepted. We've got lazy, fat and lazy, and uh, that will not do in this modern world that we're living in. We need to be those who know what we believe and are able to articulate it with our non-Christian friends. So let's grow, friends, let's grow in our knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this morning I suggest we begin right at the be no, it's right at the beginning with Luke chapter one, and that's the uh, reading. I'll just read a few verses to get you into the groove. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who, from the beginning, were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well having investigated everything carefully from the beginning to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. And then he talks about the historical setting of the gospel. Yes, the gospel that we believe in, the theology of the gospel we believe in is set in history. We can turn to our history books and read about it. I'm grateful to Carmen for leaving this book by F.F. F. Bruce. When we were at Bible College 40 years ago, F.F. F. Bruce was a renowned Bible scholar and he was already 30 years into his Bible teaching uh, uh, ministry worldwide. And uh, his books are still worth having if they're in print. Uh, this one was one that uh, I think Roger used to use and he had marks, bookmarks in it all over the place. So obviously he used it and, uh, and pen, pen uh, and some text that he's written in. And I just want to read something from the page six that this uh, gospel we believe in is founded in history. History and theology, he says, are inextricably intertwined in the gospel of our salvation. Uh, the events which happened in Palestine in the Roman Empire are events that have been recorded for us in the pages of scripture for our edification. It's the uh, way, the truth and the life that Joan, I think, was reading to us about in John's Gospel. We have a uh, gospel that uh, we can research and uh, trace and, and uh, uh, take it into our own lives in the modern era. And so the uh, gospel starts out with uh, a person called Zachariah. I'm going to be talking probably about eight people, probably as many as eight, if I can get through them all. But Zechariah comes to mind right at the beginning in verse 5. By the way, his name means God remembers. And that uh, reminds me of back in Exodus, the early chapters of Exodus. God heard the cries of his people and he did something about it. He remembered his people and he stepped into their situation and uh, promised to redeem them. He had a wife, Zechariah did, have a wife called Elizabeth. And they were elderly, and that too reminds me of another elderly couple in the Old Testament this time in the books of Genesis, where Abram and uh, Sarah were elderly and didn't have a child, even though God had promised them that they would have children. 
Sometimes we get impatient with God, don't we? It seems that He is not listening to our needs at the moment. But uh, at the right time, as it says in Romans 6, at the right time, God steps in and does what He has to do. He sees the big picture and He knows just the right time to do what has to be done in our lives as well as in Zechariah and Elizabeth's life. He came, he remembered, and he promised. And he promised that they would have a son that uh, would be called John. Of all things. I say of all things because you look at the Old Testament, you can't find that name anywhere. And certainly in the uh, lineage of Zechariah and Elizabeth, there were no Johns to be found as you find out as you read on in that chapter. But the name is significant. Uh, we were in Beirut and we walked that port district uh, soon after we were married. How many years ago is that? Uh, 47 years ago. And uh, yeah, what a different uh, port it is now. Yeah, uh, but soon after, months after we uh, were there, we were able to pick up an Arabic Bible and read it. And we found that uh, my name wasn't John after all, it was Johanna. Uh, but uh, in colloquial Arabic, we were called, or I was called, Hanna. And the feminine, Hanni, Joan is the feminine, Hanni. Hanni were Hanna. And Johanna is a, a combination of two Hebrew words. Yo, meaning Yahweh, or short for Yahweh. And you know who Yahweh is, don't you? God himself. The one who said, I am who I am, the living God, Yahweh. And the uh, second part of it, the HN of John, if you like, is uh, Hannah. And that word means grace or gracious. So John or Johanna means God is gracious. Have you experienced that graciousness? Have you experienced that grace in your lives? I guess... Because you are here, it's an indication that you do know something of that grace. Uh, by the way, that's, uh, that's Hebrew, but if you want to uh, turn over to Greek, now uh, you've got another word, and we've sung it in that song. That, uh, I think it was a quote from Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And that word joy... It's the same word closely related to the Arabic, or the, sorry, the uh, Greek for uh, <coughs> grace. If you've got the grace of the Lord running through your lives, then truly you have joy, an inner joy that the world can't, uh, can't duplicate. We need that godly grace. We need that godly joy in our lives, do we not? Well... We move on in that chapter to uh, an angel called Gabriel. Interesting, it wasn't mentioned. He wasn't mentioned by name uh, in verse 11 when he appeared to uh, Zechariah. But as we turn over to verse 26 or thereabouts, yes, in the sixth month of uh, Elizabeth's pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from a city sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph. Well, you can forget Joseph for a minute because that's the last we hear of him uh, until uh, much later on in the Gospel story. But the, uh, the virgin's name was Mary. And of course that wasn't her name either in uh, Middle Eastern parlance. It would have been Miriam, named after the prophetess in the book of Exodus. Um, Miriam was the sister of Aaron, it says in, Genesis, in Exodus 15. And therefore, it's the sister of Aaron, obviously also, though it's not mentioned, the sister of Moses. Miriam was a prophetess, it says in that uh, chapter. And uh, the angel came to Mary, to Miriam, and uh, said that she was going to have a child, a virgin child, if you like. 
or she was going to have a virgin pregnancy at any rate, and the child was going to be called the Son of the Most High, verse 32. And of course, uh, we have come to know him as Jesus. And of course, that's significant too. No, Jesus doesn't mean God is gracious or anything to do with Hannah, the word for grace. It means the Lord saves. His name in Arabic, we always called Jesus Yeshua in Arabic, uh, or Joshua in Hebrew. They uh, both mean the same thing. By the way, we had a knock on the door when we were living in Belfield in Sydney, and uh, the young guy said, I'm Jesus, uh, is Stuart home? <laughs> <laughs> we, in the, in the English world, don't use Jesus as a name for our children, do we? But the Hispanic people tend to uh, take it on board. It's a significant name, and uh, perhaps we consider it too, too special, too unique to be calling our children that name. They've got a lot to live up to, haven't they? By the way, uh, there was a track came in our letterbox a few months ago, I think you might still have it somewhere in the house, and the track was a little one about this size, on the front of it says, Jesus saves. And uh, people could well pick that up and say, oh, I wonder what that says about uh, my bank account. Uh, was he a frugal Jesus, was he? Uh, I think uh, in our day and age, you've got to be careful how you word, how you use your language, don't you? Because words that we take for granted have a different meaning to what we would use in church circles. Jesus saves. Well, anybody who is concerned about their soul's destiny would pick that up and uh, and uh, think that oh, maybe that's got something for me. Uh, I need to be saved from the person I am. I need to seek the Lord and I need to find out if this Jesus is the one who has the answers to the, to the, the uh, needs of my life. And it says in verse 33 that this Jesus who saves will reign forever. He's reigning now, folks. He's been reigning for a couple of thousand years and probably a couple of thousand years before that. Uh, it says that he will reign forever. He is working from home, however. Oh, I like that story I heard uh, during the week uh, where, uh, it might be Janet, it might be your fault for this one, where there was this plane traveling from Brisbane to Cairns, I think it was, and the pilot said, I hope you have a pleasant trip. Uh, it's going to be 30 degrees in Cairns and it should be a very enjoyable day for you. By the way, I'm working from home. <laughs> Jesus is working from home and he's preparing a place for you and I. We're going home one day soon. Can't wait, can you? I mean, it's great that we have a Jesus. We have a God who saves us. All right, moving on. Uh, I will skip a couple of points, but then as we come to chapter 2, we find that uh, Joseph and Mary both have to go to Bethlehem for a special trip. Well, I don't know why Mary had to go, heavily pregnant as she was, but uh, Joseph certainly had to because there was a census called by the emperor and nobody was exempt. They had to go to their ancestral home. In uh, this case, Joseph being a grand great 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 grandson of King David had to go to Bethlehem because that's where David was born. Bethlehem, the place of food is what it literally means, but that's where they had to go. Well, that's where Joseph had to go and he took Mary along with him on a donkey, I think, but uh, what an arduous journey for somebody very close to giving birth. I don't know why she had to go, but uh, the scripture says what it says and we have to take it that Maybe she, maybe her ancestors were born there too. and Maybe she had to also register in Bethlehem. But uh, while they were finding a manger for the night, because there was no other place for them to stay, there were some shepherds out in the paddocks and they were looking after their sheep, which suggests to me that it wasn't the dead of winter as uh, the time when we would celebrate our Christmas Yes, it's uh, not summer over there, it's uh, winter, 
and I know when we were studying Arabic up in the mountains of Lebanon, we were looking forward to our first sight of snow by Christmas. And that first year we were up in the mountains, but it didn't come. It didn't come until well into January. But the shepherds wouldn't be out watching their, their flocks in, uh, in a snow-covered field, snow field. So it's probably September, somewhere thereabouts. I would suggest that many of the Lord's promises will be fulfilled in the, uh, well, according to the feasts of the Old Testament. And September, October are significant months in, uh, in Jewish uh, festival months. So maybe it was more like now that the shepherds were out in the fields uh, and uh, when they were busy watching their, their sheep, a great light shone on, upon them. And an angel spoke to them. Again, it doesn't mention his name. There are many angels, aren't there? And uh, maybe it was Gabriel again, but uh, they were sure that it was God himself who was speaking. And he brings good news of great joy. There's that word joy again. And uh, it will be for all people. And I would suggest that the shepherds took a hold of that because the all people must surely have included them. The shepherds were the people who were down at the bottom of the social rung. They weren't worthy of, of, of mention, really. Uh, they, weren't, uh, they were dirty, they, were, they weren't educated and they were considered as nobodies. But this message they uh, took upon themselves as being for them as well as for anybody else. And so what did they do? They packed up their uh, swags and off into Bethlehem they went to see this promised Messiah. They brought their, their, uh, their gifts and their, well their gifts of worship really, and uh, worshiped the Lord. I guess that's our response too. I remember it was 1969 in a forestry barracks in the most unlikely circumstances that an Aborigine shared the gospel of Jesus Christ with me and I thought, hmm, I need to do something about God in my life and uh, gave my life to him uh, at the end of May 1969. And uh, what great joy filled my life thereafter. I started going to the Aboriginal church at Cherbourg and then eventually found my home in the Church of Christ in Kingaroy. But there's something magnetic about the person of Jesus. Once you've met him, you don't want to let him go, do you? And uh, so the uh, shepherds, they realized that they had a message that was worth following up on, investigating. And this is the thing with the Christian life. We don't just hear about it and then take it home and forget about it. No, we investigate. We've got a big book here. Joan and I are reading it through at night time the second time. We're on, I'm on page 1063 so far. I don't know. We should just about finish it by Christmas. That's my goal anyway. We'll see how we go. Three or four chapters a night. It's a book worth investigating, friends. Don't just leave it on your shelf. And uh, if there's a Bible study going anywhere, try and join in on it and learn as much as you can about this Jesus who you've, uh, who you've invited to be Lord of your life. Let him be Lord of your life. Take him on board and take him for all he's worth. Well, the next person we meet is in verse 25. His name is Simeon. And uh, I could turn over to chapter 2, hadn't I? And verse, what verse did I say it was? 25. Yeah. I'll read it to you. There was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Wow, that's saying something, isn't it? That he was that convinced that uh, the Holy Spirit was going to allow him to see the Savior of the world before he died. And so it happened. And uh, so he blessed the Lord in verse 29. You are releasing your bondservant now and to depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, 
and further on he uses a different word I have seen your redemption in other words it's a buyback strategy that God's got going you know you you, uh, you find that uh, in the commercial world that you have something that uh, is not working properly so you take it back to the dealer and he has to buy it back from you it's a kind of a buyback scheme that's what that word redemption means just that to buy back and that's what God is doing for us we were his we've gone astray as the uh, scriptures said that Neil read this morning in Isaiah 53 and now uh, God is buying us back at great cost and finally you'll be pleased to hear that word finally we meet Hannah the other Hannah uh, we uh, saw that uh, that John uh, really means Hannah as well and now we've got somebody who in your Bible is probably written as a double N A the daughter of Phanuel she was advanced in years and had lived with her husband only seven years after her marriage and then she was a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple serving night and day with fastings and prayers and at that very moment in that very hour she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Who was this Anna? It says in verse 36 that she was a prophetess. A prophetess is uh, the feminine of a prophet, and a prophet is somebody who speaks forth the word of God. And uh, so we take heart that anybody who uh, is a servant of the Lord has this potential ministry, although God gives gifts according to his uh, for ordained purposes. So maybe there's some prophetesses here in our midst today, and maybe some prophets. I think Martin Isles uh, of the Australian Christian Lobby must go close to being a prophet among us in our day and age. He seems to have a discernment uh, beyond human discernment to be able to uh, see what's happening in our world and know how to confront our politicians and the decision makers with good legislation or at least that's his goal and that was the goal of the prophets of the Old Testament too they constantly badgered those in authority to change laws or to make sure that laws would change that God's laws would be number one so that's the role of a prophetess or a prophet to speak forth the uh, word of the Lord and uh, that makes us all in that sense prophets and prophetesses here in this room would you not agree to some extent we're all called to be witnesses of the grace that we have found in the Lord Jesus Christ and I just conclude